Sea Palace High above 2919 East Broadway. This is our number two of the Jake Feinberg Show. Coming to you live on Power Talk. Please go to our website, powertalk.live. Download our free app and stream all of our live local shows, including Solomon on Blast, The Jim Parisi Show, and yours truly, The Jake Feinberg Show. And we can't thank you enough for making us part of your day today so I can shed some light and give some exposure to a, a real troubadour and a guy who has continued a prolific career. He's got his hand in a whole bunch of different jars. And uh, he first came on my map because uh, a lot of times at night, uh, as we're winding down in the evening, um, we like to put on some some good music for the kids at home. And um, I ran into an album that this this gentleman uh, put together back in the early 70s, and it has just been intoxicating for me and my children it holds up better than any jack johnson album today holds up better than any children's album today which is really the only music if you're really listening that you can dance to uh he's currently looking for uh working for uh you know the integral life uh and uh it is an honor to bring in david reardan to the jake feinberg show hi jake how are you brother <laughs> good it's I'm great. Good. It's great to talk to you, man. Uh, yeah. It's really, really an honor. I, you know, I, I just, I was, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, your exposure, uh, direct exposure to cats like uh, Ferlin Getty, Ginsburg, uh, and Kerouac, and any of these guys that were performing in the Berkeley area when you were coming of age. Well, I mean, as I grew up in Berkeley, which is an odd thing. People don't think that people actually grow up in Berkeley, given its <laughs> reputation. But we did. I did. And uh, and at the time, you know, when you're a kid, you just feel, you, you know, you just think your town is like every other town. It's not till you get out of Berkeley and look back and say that was actually a fairly extraordinary, eclectic way to grow up and, you know, sort of come of age. So because it was Berkeley and because I was really involved in the folk music scene as a teenager, um, I was at a lot of the hoot nannies and, you know, those kinds of gatherings that included poets and all those things that sort of predated the explosion of uh, the sort of the San Francisco scene, which was really about 1966. And so I was just exposed, but I was, I was a kid listening more than anything else to, uh, you know, a variety of these perspectives. It was really sort of coming out of the beat generation uh, that, Recluded what was about to happen, but none of us had any idea this was going to go on. So, could you talk about this? Is the pre pre uh, explosion of people that were coming from across the country? Can you talk about the eccentric qualities of of the pre sixty six Berkeley? Yeah, well, I mean, mostly as I said that, and I'm my orientation is always as a storyteller. So whether it was music and records that I made, or films, or documentaries now for the last 10 years um my my orientation even though as a kid i didn't quite realize it at the time was always about the stories being told and so um i was really interested in in this sort of this beat eclectic sort of thing i mean i you know i came from a fairly white background even for berkeley and and um you know fairly middle class but i really hadn't been exposed to all this and i I just found it fascinating so most of the people that were in that scene you know that i was just at the edge of and they were nice enough to let us play every now and then um this would turn into what then started as you know sort of the counterculture explosion that starts to take place across the country but one of those places was in the bay area and so that everybody that i had been uh, around playing folk music with by the time I went off to college for one semester and came back to go to the Fillmore Auditorium for the first time most of those people were in the first generation San Francisco bands that would have included everybody from Quicksilver to Loading Zone to Jefferson Airplane to you know Janice eventually and you know a variety of other people that had all been folk musicians and then ult- ultimately electrified and that whole thing just exploded into what was to come Sure. No, I mean, uh, I talked to David Nelson one of the this week, one of the new writers of the Purple Sage, and he was right. talking really about uh, this bookstore um, that they took over eventually, uh, where you'd have poetry readings and theater, and you know, these again, this is the jug band days. But what could you talk about a seminal poet or story that had an impact on you 
I, I don't care about the the. Right. I mean, I love the the electricity and the the oozing of psychedelia at the Fillmore West. But I mean, let's face it: the Grateful Dead in 1965, they were doing something new. Jerry Garcia was being told by promoters, "Hey, man, play the stock tunes, man. We're going to put more butts in the seats. We'll sell more tickets." And he said, "Nah, what's it? What's what? What good is it for?" That was mm-hmm. before the summer. So what I'm saying it's about new creating new. The the new what was can you talk can you put us back in the in the Berkeley that you were in and and a, and a story or a poet that you that you got you off? Yeah, I mean, I I was uh, still drawn to the musicians probably more than the poets. Although I ended up writing a lot of songs, and so poetry is certainly a part of lyrics and all of that. And I mean, to me, you know, in in these small clubs and gatherings where these hootenannies would take place. Um, you know, they were basically smoke-filled rooms, um, not all of it probably legal at that point. Right. And, uh, the, you know, as a kid, I mean, I'm, I'm basically a teenager. I haven't gone off to college yet. I was just wide-eyed in terms of the sort of mix of music and poetry and ideas, and people would stand up and, you know, go on some rant about whatever they were doing. And uh, and sometimes that was in a poetry form, and sometimes it was in music. But I I basically, you know loved the musicians because that's really my my dream at that point as a teenager was to be a rock and roll star right that was you know it just seemed like a good life i mean later on as i write and and i really fell in love with it in a lot of ways but you know i was very impressionable so that whole scene that was very small clubs and small gatherings at churches and and things like that ultimately became a larger version at the at the Fillmore and a variety of other places like it but I do remember going to the Fillmore when I came back from college after my first semester and walking in as uh, it was a religious experience I mean I just hadn't seen anything that combined this very interesting electrified folk music with light shows with poetries at the break with you know, people doing all kinds of uh, dance and, you know, whatever, and certainly the drugs were around, um, that I just went immediately, this I have to do. When I was a folk kid, I was sort of saying, well, this is interesting, and I like this, and I guess I'm okay at it because they keep letting us play. But that, I just said, that is what I want to do. And so I went back down to Cal Poly in, in the Central California where I was going to college and just told everybody, I said, this is what we have to do, and that's what happened. I mean, it, the whole scene then exploded kind of from there. So. Talking to David Reardan here on the Jake Feinberg show. Did you, um, I mean, every, I mean, even if you were in uh, Cal Poly, there was still a scene there. Uh, what was, can you? Well, there really wasn't. I mean, when I went, I mean, Cal Poly in those days, it's a big uh, state university now. I think there's over 35,000 kids there. And um, I don't think I could get in. I couldn't get into Cal Berkeley, and I, you know, and basically I wouldn't have anyway because I'd been up there a lot. My family was very connected with uh, University of California Berkeley, and but I just wanted to go. I just wanted to get out. And Cal Poly was this little little town at that point. Um, half of the school was agriculture, which was a real change for me coming from the city, and um, you know, lots of cowboys and things like that. And there was a little bit of a scene, but. We then took over what were the concerts at the college, and they had been doing all the 50s acts like Dueling Pianos, Franny and Teicher. Uh, I, you know, they were singers or something, but it right. certainly wasn't our generation. And we immediately then booked all those first bands, both from San Francisco and L.A., because San Luis Obispo is, is right in the middle, right? So it was a stop, because before everybody got in airplanes and we all toured later, uh, people were doing bus tours, and they were in their cars and their Volkswagen buses and things like that. So uh, San Luis Obispo was the perfect stop. So we were able to book everybody that we liked. And, of course, there were a lot of uh, people in the administration that when they saw what we were doing <laughs> sort of had that reaction that we all got. And certainly there was a reaction from some of the more conservative kids. But we really sort of started that, brought the bands in, created their own scene, and then Central California, like everywhere else, then, you know, sort of took on a thing, and it became sort of the central coast of California's version of all that. What, um, yeah, I remember talking to John Shear, the great mm-hmm. concert promoter in the yep. East Coast, and he said this. it was the same, it was the idea of getting onto this, this the, these committees, right? You get onto the yep. mu- music committee. Where did that fun, I mean, that to me was, that's what was the galvanizing force. On top of that, you had... Uh, freeform radio at the universities so you could really pretty much play 
the, whatever music you wanted to. Yeah, that was eventually that was true. And there was also in San Luis Obispo, there was a local AM radio that had uh, some very hip people at it. So we be, all became friends because we were part of the scene and sort of, you know, I'd go down and sit with these jocks at night. It was just fun. You know, so radio was fun. You were sort of talking to people you couldn't see, but it was all very mysterious and exciting. And, and you know, they would play a lot of interesting music, including ours. And, and so we actually built quite a following in Central California before I went to L.A. and before all Green-Eyed Lady happened and, you know, all the rest of that. So we had a scene that you actually could make some money at. I mean, you could actually make a living, um, you know, throwing these concerts. And the advantage to being at the college was that you got access. I mean, people don't think about this, but we got access to all the audiovisual equipment, right? So that was huge speaker stacks. It was every overhead projector that they had, all for educational purposes. We wouldn't tell them what we were going to do. We would check them all out go do this huge happening in the airplane hangar that was up on the hill that would hold like about 2,000 people <laughs> and then bring all the stuff back in on Monday and they would go, what happened to these overhead projectors? They've got paint all over them. <laughs> and I go, oh, yeah, I don't, I, it must have been an art class or something, right? So uh, it was, you know, so it was an advantage. And I got to say, they didn't shut us down. They tried a couple times, but they didn't shut us down. And, you know, for that matter, it was just a wave that was happening. And I think uh, the kids wouldn't have let them do that. So. Well, I mean, on top of that, I mean, you're talking about, a, I mean, a major, I mean, the audiovisual today is, it costs so much money. I sean, sure. It didn't cost anything back then. No. Um, it, no, I mean, they were simply, I mean, you took an overhead projector for those people that are <laughs> young, they probably don't know what that is, but it was simply a light with a glass plate with a thing that projected an image up on the wall, and you were supposed to put these acrylic, you know, slides from school, you know, it would project a, <laughs> a you know, some kind of thing up on the wall. And what the light show people did is they just took dishes and put paint in them and, you know, all kinds of other, and geometric patterns. And so all of that then became these giant projections, which were very acid-like in a certain way, um, you know, off of this very simple technology. Well, we're starting to cook now with David Rear Dan here on the Jake Feinberg Show. Can you talk about uh, I I have a my gut feeling says that you definitely ran into some of the merry pranksters like Ken Kesey. I mean, can you talk about uh, the, the 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 traveling road show that was the merry pranksters? Yeah, they would they would show up, and I mean, I I, I didn't go on the road with them. I, I know mean, you no no it, no I know you didn't go on yeah, the road, but paint the picture. Would, of I them. mean, I oh, remember yeah, I remember one time that um I'm uh, Hugh Hugh what, what was uh, Pig uh, uh, Hugh the oh uh, no Hugh Rom Wavy, Wavy, yeah, Wavy, Wavy Gravy Wavy Gravy Wavy Gravy yeah, thank yeah, you yeah, Hugh Romney uh you know walking in the door where we were somewhere and said hey we need a couch to crash on and you know he was just a fascinating guy he was he was like a rodeo clown if we you know for those that remember. Uh, what is that? No, I don't remember. What is that? Explain. Well, I mean, sort of like if you remember him, if you watch the Woodstock film, you'll see him. Big floppy hat, big uh, coveralls. Sure. And he was kind of the jokester. So he would be, while he was very seriously promoting feeding everybody and communes and that kind of lifestyle, uh, he was also pranking everybody. He would he would not let everybody take themselves so damn seriously, right? <laughs> Which we all did. Exactly. Yeah, and so that, and I don't know, the, I've read about the pranksters and all the rest of that, and I think to a certain extent there was a certain shock value that they would roll into town, and I can certainly tell you from when we would drive from the coast over, say, to central California, the valley, which was much more conservative, Bakersfield, Fresno, to go play, we would roll in in our painted buses and everybody dressed and whatever, and, uh, you know, there were qu there were quite a few moments at truck stops and everything else where there was a clash of cultures, shall we say. <laughs> Can you, you see, I would love you to, this is so important, if you could mm -hmm. talk about, um, when you say, we, when we would play, can you talk mm -hmm. about that band amalgamation, that's early reared and... Well, the, yeah, the first electric band, we, I mean, originally we called ourselves Pacific Grass and Electric, and every, you oh, know, take all, off on oh, the, that's great. The, the utility company. Oh, that's and, great. <laughs> um, and we got noticed, and, they, and Herb Cain, who was the big columnist in the San Francisco Chronicle, my mother loved this because she loved Herb Cain, you know, did a whole piece on us because we were fast rising and all that kind of stuff. Um, but when we actually went to make our first record, they were very, the record company was very concerned that that name would not allow you on the air because it, it seems so innocuous now. But at the time, any mention of marijuana or any mention of, you know, alternative substances – 
uh, just couldn't get played on AM radio because of the FCC. And so uh, they changed our name. This was my first experience with big corporations that just sort of said, all right, this is what we're doing. They changed it to Yankee Dollar, which we hated. Um, but at the time, we just said, well, the records are good, and I guess we'll, I guess that's what we're going to be called. Because, you know, if you go back and look at any of the names of any of the groups that, you know, we all came to know and love, Jefferson Airplane, they all had crazy names, you know, at, 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 awful names in a certain way. So we, that was it, and it was Yankee Dollar. And that record uh, was, do we just, you know, we just had one record. We were juniors in college, and, um, you know, one of the singles made it up into the top 50 and almost, you know, made it all the way up. But, um, then it, then we broke up, and you know it was sort of like we had a fun band in our senior year, and then I went off to the Los Angeles to pursue things that eventually, very quickly became Green Eyed Lady becoming a hit and all that stuff. So, um, so you changed your name that you hated, but I mean, could you? I mean, essentially, were you just playing stock tunes, or were you actually? Did... Oh no, no, no! This was all our own music. So I mean, can you? That... T- I mean, can you talk about uh, one of the early, not the stuff that made pop, you know, made it above. Uh, ground but i mean can you talk about the organic nature of your songwriting and maybe uh compare it and and then and then uh talk about an early tune that you put together that can uh, back that up yeah i mean i mean well, i mean song everybody does songwriting differently i mean my my thing is i usually get a picture of the words first um you know i'm a good musician but i'm not a great musician like people i was hanging out with that were really called to it and and were geniuses in a lot of ways um i worked hard and i i could stay up with them but i could write lyrics that's why they asked me to do that so there was always some picture first of of something and and then ultimately the music came and then you know there was a very collaborative thing within the group is somebody would bring something in and we'd work it you know as the group and people would add things to it and and it you know ultimately would become you know a song and there you know and then there would be a record version of it i've often felt through all of the 130 songs that i wrote that i i just i actually liked some of the earlier versions when we were just fooling around and kind of rehearsing it uh, than the records, right? Because the records all became what they needed to be to be records, and I like some of them, and I did a couple of them that I really like. But mostly, I, I sort of like that beginning stage where we were playing with it, and it was all new and exciting, and you know, something fresh would come out in that given moment. Well, could you could you uh, with Pacific Grass or mm-hmm. whatever they changed it to and, and mangled the name? Can you talk? <laughs> well, Yankee Dollar. Yankee what Dollar. I mean, can you yeah. talk about a tune that maybe never even got pressed that you can? That you can that can back up what you just said. No, no. I mean, it, they all got. I mean, they pretty much all got pressed because we were fairly efficient, and you know, in those days, you could make an album for thirty five, forty thousand dollars, which is just a ridiculously low amount of money now. Um, you know, so pretty much everything that we thought would be on the album, you know, would get there. And then on the Yankee Dollar album also had some songs from two particular songwriters that we had met. One of them was John uh, Carter, who's since died, but. John went on to have, I actually, on my Capitol album, he was my, you know, was my executive producer on that album, which was way later, it was in 75. But John's claim to fame was that he brought uh, Tina Turner back, and that whole splash that she had after being with Ike and all that stuff, where she was on her own, um, that was all, you know, John orchestrated all that, and that was what he was known for. So he was a great songwriter and a and kind of a beat poet himself, and and just a very interesting guy. So he's no longer with us. No, he died. Um, I want to say two thousand and eight, two thousand and nine, something like that. Well, I just um, I wanted to ask you about uh, your transition to the uh, to the studio scene. I mean, where when you when you moved down to Los yeah. Angeles, who who kind of opened it? Opened the door? Did you already have people that were you were connected? Well, to? I did. I mean, the producer of our Yankee Dollar album, which was '68, so that I went to LA in in the '70, 19, well '69, really. It was another year in San Luis, and then I went off. Um, and his name was Frank Slay, and Frank was was an old time uh, we considered because we were just kids, an old time producer that had been around in the '50s and then had done some hit records with Freddie Cannon and a bunch of other stuff that was well known and uh, was very good friends with the Four Seasons and Bob Crew and that whole gang that's been that's now been made into a movie and you know what happened to them and all that Frank was around that and was a very important you know producer and all that um, and he had produced the the Yankee Dollar album he had come up to San Luis and seen us he'd heard about us and seen us and 
offered us a record contract, which was great. That was a magic moment to get your first one. And, um, and so when I went to L.A., I went and saw him, and, and basically he had a big songwriting publishing company that in those days he would pay you know, songwriters like me and Jerry Corbetto, whom we wrote Green-Eyed Lady together, that he would pay us enough money to kind of live on to uh, do songs that he would take out to other people. So we, it was almost like being in school. It was, it was very good for writing chops and learning how to write a commercial song and, you know, all those things. And so we'd sit around and dream something up for Barbara Streisand if that was the day or, you know, whatever. And sometimes they got done, sometimes they didn't. Um, but ultimately, we all wanted to do our own music. So we had these little two-track studios available to us that we could go cut these demos of the songs we were doing for other people. And then if there was time left, we would end up, you know, doing some initial recordings of some of our own music and for Jerry and I, that eventually uh, then emerged into Sugarloaf was his group and Sweet Pain was my group. And, and of course, we wrote Green Eyed Lady together and Sugarloaf was the one that had the big hit with that. So that came out. So that was a that was a scene that doesn't exist anymore. I mean, it, it, it was the last of sort of the Tin Pen Alley story publisher things where publishing was a big business. And um, and you could you know, you could make a decent living while you were trying to work out your own stuff being a songwriter. Can you uh, this is can you uh, unpack that Tin Pan Alley analogy there? It's so well, Tim, you I mean if you watch any of the movies about I'm thinking of um uh like Ray Charles as an example, you know that great movie they did about Ray. Absolutely, um, yeah. And there are whole scenes of them in New York in the Brill Building, which is where Ahmed Aragon from Atlantic Records and Jerry Weinstein was his partner, and you know, and and there were all those New York record companies. I never, there was an LA version of that, right? And so literally, it was like a business with all these publishing houses and small record companies, big record companies, whatever. And uh, you know, so that you would walk into the building, it was like walking into a, a, a university of songwriters, right? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you know, and you know, another person, Carol King, which everybody knows, you know, and she and, and Jerry Goff were part of that New York scene. And, you know, we'd get there, de- we'd hear some of the demos that, and this is all before she does her own records, and always said, wow, that Carol King could be an artist in her own right, right? Because she would make these demos for people, you know, that she was doing. And then that all turned out to be great, you know, eventually for her. And it was great to see that happen. So it was a scene that was sort of the last of the 40s, 50s, and then 60s. Uh, kind of that's the way the music business was. It was fairly small. Uh, it exploded in 75 just as I got out. And it was one of the reasons why I did is not because I had any problem with that. It's just it just changed from a very sort of, small kind of thing where you could basically do a demo of a song and have expectation that it that the six major record companies their a and r departments would listen to it and if it was any good it would be on the street in three weeks it was a very fast efficient business that then turned into much bigger later on um and so that was the last of tin pen alley was that sort of that whole scene of songwriters sitting around in offices and pianos going and people dancing up and down the Always, and you know, trying to work it out, trying to make, <laughs> trying to make records. Uh, you know, who worked at the Brill Building uh, uh, was uh, doing demos uh, for Motown was George Clinton way yep. back when, you know, yep. which is really quite, uh, quite. How how do you feel that 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 model uh, helped cultivate? How does it help cultivate an art? We're nowhere near that now, and people can woodshed and make their own records and mm-hmm. you know and and but you know i mean how did in your mind how did that help spawn this incredible amount of authentic music well there there was um i mean i, I you know i sound like an old guy sort of looking back on the old days and i don't want to glorify them any more than they were because i, I think there's a lot of good music being done now uh it's just being done totally differently i mean in terms of how you support yourself and the internet, you know, allows you certain access, but then again, you're up against everybody, you know, thousands of people that we never did because the record companies really were the were the guardian gates. And as much as we didn't like them, or that when we got turned down, or they did something crazy with the name of the group, or like that, they were basically the ones that were choosing the best of what was emerging and actually putting it out. So there was a, you know, there was there was a certain quality and a polish to that. And I think the other thing, too, is that just like any scene, and later on, you know, film schools became kind of the same thing, and where where you're, 
you're basically interacting with peers, you know, and you're all trying to do the same thing, and you're influenced by each other, and you listen to what people are doing and borrow the best of it, and they do the same with you. Um, I think some really, really good music came out of that, and and as music then for like uh, just like if you just take some of the Brill Building people, uh, Carol King, uh, Neil Diamond, you know, all those folks that later on will become artists of their own. Um, they started writing different material as a result, and there was enough. As long as you kept the beast fed, you could work on stuff, and then eventually that changed music. So uh, I, it was just a magic time to be involved with it, and I'm not saying that there hasn't been good music since. There obviously is or, or now, but late 60s to the middle 70s, that explosion that took place with, with the boomers coming of age, which I'm one of them, um, that was just a very exciting time to be in the music business and be around it because it really was where everybody was expressing what they were feeling. Ultimately, I also feel like some of the people like Ahmed Erdogan, Jerry Wexler, uh, the list goes on and on and on. Mm -hmm. Those cats, uh, oh, I know Norman Granz, for instance, mm -hmm. I mean, when, when he was putting out uh, all that stuff on, you know, for, I mean, he, he his philosophy was, hey, man, I, I'm going to put out this Oscar Peterson album and yep. I don't really care if it sells two copies because it's what the label stands for. So yeah. And I think, and radio also supported that. So, you know, you have to remember, I mean, now we live in this world and have really since the internet came into consumer land in mid nineties, um, the music was very regional. It, it was, there were scenes. So for instance, in, between being on the West Coast, I was a West Coast kid. I, I didn't, you know, until we toured, I didn't really meet a lot of the people in New York and see kind of what was going on there. But even more so, we would go into a place like Detroit or Cleveland or one of those kinds of things, and we would hear groups that you would never hear on the coast that were wildly <laughs> popular in those areas. Right. And you would just go, and eventually most of them that were any good broke out and became national acts or international acts. But at the time, radio was people that really cared about music, and I'm not saying that there wasn't payola and all the rest of that. There was. But you would sit with radio jocks and talk music, right? That was half the fun of being out on tour is that there would be a lot of, you know, back and forth about what was good music and what was new and what people were trying that was new and so on. And there, and there was a, a huge landscape to play in. One of the things that I really feel now as I – check into the music business and or kids you know will come and see me or something and think I have something to say about it now which I don't really it, it I don't you know I don't know what we would have done because in it, I don't want to say everything's been done but mostly what I hear is is our evolutions of things that started in that 60s to 70s place now certainly rap wasn't around then and all the rest of that but but there were you know there was plenty of room to move so, for instance, with Green Eyed Lady, Jerry was a trained jazz musician. Well, that sound that he made on the keyboard that ultimately became the sound of Green Eyed Lady when it became the hit was a very jazz-oriented rock. There just wasn't anything else like it. Now you hear it all the time. I mean, you hear people you know, mixing and matching mediums all the time. But at the time, it was just this wildly experimental time where, where just almost anything went, and there was a place for it if it was any good. Have you... Uh... I mean, I was just talking to a drummer uh, in Austin before you, and uh, I just wonder if you've ever considered uh, doing, or you, maybe you have done any film work uh, be on uh, these flyover towns because, uh, you know, the urban centers in our country now, w they used to be factories and havens for cultivating these artists and bands. And like you said, there's all this regionalism, whether it was yeah. Chicago, Los Angeles, Seattle. And right. now it's more... The flyover towns where yeah. you have this organic stuff going on austin uh tucson to a degree tulsa oklahoma have you contemplated the idea that uh well there's a two-part question have you done anything in that vein have you thought about it as far as film in that sense and also um in terms of extending vocabulary in any genre of music how in your opinion um could that or should that happen well, when, I mean, the, the short answer to your question is no. I'm, from a film or a television standpoint, that's certainly not something I ever explored. And there, there is this sort of mixed feeling in me about it. Is that, and when we watch films being made, and for the most part, most of them are trying too hard. In my, you know, what does that mean? What does that mean? It's, well, it's really hard to sort of get 
what was really going on. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, is that all of us remember it in more glowing terms, I'm sure, than what was really happening. Well, I mean, unless you're talking to Jake Feinberg, who wasn't born during that time. Well, of course. Okay, so I'll give you an example of one that did work, because I talked about it earlier. I thought the Ray movie um, got as close as you could to the variety of scenes that he worked himself up through, right? So when he's a sideman and you're sort of seeing him play in black clubs, they're kind of doing a thing, but he keeps stretching, and you know some people can stay with him, some people can't, and and then he sort of, and then eventually he makes the crossover. There's certainly all the racial stuff that's going on. I thought, and and, and in terms of the Ahmed Arrogant story with him and all of that, I I thought that that was as close as you could probably get to what that experience used to feel like. But I'll use another example is like the Doors movie, you know, because they were an L.A. group and certainly we were around them. And I remember when they were a house band, you know, at uh, the Whiskey A Go-Go and, and, you know, Jim, you know, basically saying with his back to the audience, nobody looked at them and said they're going to do some amazing (laughs) stuff. Right. (laughs) But that movie, that movie, I know it tried hard to sort of get the alternate states that of course Jim was in and sort of the what was fueling the music but it, it just felt phony to me in a in a certain sort of way it's interesting yeah yeah I, now yeah, i will say this that later on when i in a the third uh, sort of chapter of my career when i was running um interactive media groups for time warner and disney and and particularly because i'd never been with warner brothers records it was the one record company i'd never done anything with and of course i always wanted to do something with them but we then, we tried in some of the interactive media we were doing um, to uh, get back into some of the things like you could mix your own video or you could make your own record or you could be part of a game that was sort of the scene from going to being unknown to known and, and you could then do a film version of what it was like to try to break down those barriers and all the rest of it. Um, and so that's something that, that we did play around with and, you know, with, with some success and um but that that was sort of the extent of it for me what what could you point to anything that you had success with oh god you mean in terms of actual titles they're all long gone i mean there was um <laughs> no i mean i mean more to more to the point of like the stuff you did with uh the interactive stuff like where you said there was some there was... well yeah what we were trying to do is that i mean obviously these were we were playing around with this whole notion what's an interactive movie where the where the player gets to you know have some say over how the thing unfolds so we did things where we would take a, say a very simple mixing uh, thing and there would be some music you could mix into a record and then if you got good enough you would get a de- I mean it was all that sort of fantasy about you know becoming a successful artist mm-hmm. um, and it it was back in a time when multimedia which is really what we were working with was brand new and everybody was playing with stuff. Um, I'm not saying any of that stuff really took off. I mean, what eventually became the game business is what we see now, which is sports games and shooters and, um, you know, basically, well, they're real interactive movies now. It's it's pretty amazing what they're doing. Um, But a lot of that stuff that everybody thought people might be interested in, um, you know, wasn't, uh, didn't didn't work as well. But certainly we played around and it was fun. Did you... uh, can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, where you see, uh, where, where you're at right now, um, creatively and post election, what is something that you, you are really folk? I mean, there's a lot of different possibilities of not, not even what, who wins. It's just, what are you thinking about as far as like, uh, what is driving you creatively post election? Well, I mean, I, it, a little bit of context, if so, it would make some sense. Sure. I mean, for the last 10 to 15 years, I have been after chasing this thing about wanting to do documentary um, films and web media because the, the, even the documentary form has changed so much because of the Internet. And, um, and I still like full documentaries, but I think that also uh, people's attention spans have gotten so short that you've got to do some other things. And so, um, you know, so we've been looking at, uh, sort of the now and the future of everything, which is a huge subject, but we're looking at all kinds of different cutting edge, you know, ideas. And so, and we look at them with a particular view, which I won't go into at the moment, but what we have seen coming is that there, which is, is represented by this election in a certain sort of way, um, is that there, 
as we start to move from sort of a nation state world, right, which we've all grown up in, where I'm from the United States and somebody else is from Europe and sure. then there's Russia and sure. China and yeah, all yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, I mean, and this isn't any my invention, we're moving to a global community and a global governance system, if for no other reason, is because we really can't solve the problems like climate change or tra you know drug trafficking or what that like that unless you take a global approach to it a, a single country even like the united states if they said tomorrow which it was interesting climate change didn't come up in any of the debates at all no, you know none. and you know and you go all right so let's just say that the united states decided that it was going green tomorrow whatever that meant right mm -hmm. it wouldn't make any difference i mean it would make some difference in this country but if you don't get China and Russia and all the emerging countries that want to be like the U.S., right, that want to be in this big, you know, consumer culture and whatever, um, if you don't get everybody to buy in like they've tried to, you know, a variety of things uh, in conferences and stuff, uh, you're just not going to make much headway. So we see this big wave of globalization going on. At the same time, you see a lot of anger and frustration of people that don't feel that they are – going along on the wave, right? So a as an example, if you take an average American worker, and certainly um, these make up some of Trump's supporters, and why do they support someone that seems to be demonstrating over and over again he doesn't have the emotional or psychological uh, maturity to be president? Um, not, you know, whatever. I mean, whatever you think of all that. But you look at somebody that is, a say, a blue-collar worker that lost their job in Detroit, I think both candidates have been very unfair in promising to bring those jobs back. They're not coming back. I mean, in a certain sense, we're, we're already on a jag that is leading into such change over the next five to ten years that those jobs literally are not going to exist. They're going to be automated, which they already are to a certain extent. The evolution of AI is changing everything so quickly it makes your head spin. Um, so I'll take as an example the classic – male archetype of the truck driver right and this is an archetype so there are all kinds of truck drivers and some of them are women too i know but we just think of the truck driver as being this guy with a baseball hat sort of blue collar you know tough guy works on his own works hard to support his family all those great things right literally within five to ten years you are going to see self-driving trucks that don't require drivers jesus and it just sounds like a sci-fi movie but this is coming I mean, if you pay any attention, this is coming. And so when you, when you see this wave of anger, regardless of what our sort of our view of this at Integral Life is that regardless of what the outcome is, and of course we would hope that Hillary with all of her baggage, you know, gets picked because I think she's a more mature sort of representative to kind of keep the status quo, but that's not going to end the story. The wave is happening all by itself, and that globalization wave, and either if you're participating in it or not participating in it, um, there are huge changes that are emerging that I don't think anybody really has a, a fix on how this is all going to go. I mean, who would, have guessed, yeah. who would have guessed that a major political party would nominate Donald Trump to be their nominee? Well, I want to I want to counter you on a couple things. Sure. Uh, uh, you, well, you know, regard, I agree with you. I, I think... Uh, the idea that uh, I mean I don't hear it so much from Hillary, but I hear it a lot from Trump about promising you know bringing back coal jobs and old, right. old energy and that stuff. It's just never going to come back, and I and I think that's that's dubious. But in my opinion, at thirty eight, um, I'm going to make this declaration to David Reardon now, and we, we we can have some we can have a beer over this or whatever sure. in a year. Um, I actually think that Trump um, is doing what he has to do to get elected. Therefore, he is uh, taking this constituency uh, of very uh, people that are not on the wave, uh, and and it's going it could it could potentially carry him into the White House. But I think one reason the establishment of his party is not supporting him, and one reason he could lose the election is because he is could potentially be one of the most progressive presidents in our history. And I know it sounds ridiculous because of the no, stuff that comes out no, of his it, mouth. It's it's one of the narratives that's out there. I mean, I mean, so maybe I mean, all I'm saying is I, I'm not I will not vote for Donald Trump. I don't I have two daughters. I don't like the way uh, right. he's divisive. And I don't think he's a, le a, a real leader. There's a, a, n a number of reasons. But all I'm getting at is that, that you said the status quo. 
I don't know how. I don't know. The, the, the status quo seems like that's kind of not the trendy thing these days. I, I, well, I, I mean, here's let me just jump. Yeah, I mean, a little ahead. bit. I mean, we don't have to go into this in a long way. I mean, and again, this is just my personal. It's all perspective. good. Yeah. It's not any you know great truth or something, but. Um, I, I think that w- what we have not understood, and in integral life this is sort of what we're exploring, is that actually the role of the presidency has changed, very quietly, sort of in the background. But, and this is one of the things that's said about Trump, is that, you know, why would he want to be president, right? That's an interesting question, because he has much more power to do whatever he wants to do if he becomes president, right? Mm-hmm. And, and particularly if the Congress is... He goes a little bit of Democratic or whatever. Sure, right? sure. He's going to run into the same thing that Obama ran into, that Bush ran into to a certain extent, is this sort of stalemate. And so he's not completely wrong. There is, in a sense, in his words, a rig system going on, right, that, that has very definite rules. Like, for instance, in Colorado, we have a measure on the ballot this time that basically if you're registered as an independent, up until this point, you have not been able to vote in the primary elections. Why is that? I think it's the same in it. My producer is saying Arizona is the same way. Yeah. I mean, why is that? You just kind of go, well, that's just odd. Why, why can't I be an independent and, and any given day vote for a Republican, Democrat, independent in the primaries? Why do I have to wait till the general election? Right, right. right. So in a certain sense, he's right that there is a system that has a series of rules that sort of holds us. So what is the president then? And this is really where I land on Hillary is that the, the presidency really has, been more, it has become more of a management job. Because if anybody really believes, if all of us sitting out here as the little people really believes that any of the promises that, that they're going to revolutionize health care, that they're going to go in and, you know, build a wall on the border, whatever it all that is, right? If you really think the president can do that by themselves, then you don't understand what's happened to the office, is that basically it's become a managerial uh, thing. I mean, look at all the things as much as we were all excited about, and I participated in getting Obama elected twice. Sure, me too. And we were all so excited about what he was going to do. And I'm saying, look, he is going to be seen as a good president. I think he's going to do amazing things when he gets out of the White House. But what is that? He's getting out of the limitations of what he can do in the White House. He's going to, I think he's going to become this global leader like you won't believe, right? No, I think he'll have, I think he'll be, have a, probably an 85 to 90 percent approval rating two yeah. years from now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and, you know, and yeah. so, so, the pre, so then when you look at the presidency from that angle, and I'll stop this in a second, but when you look at it from that angle and you say, well, then what we want is a capable manager. We re, and I don't mean status quo that nothing changes, but we need a capable manager until we actually deal with all the stuff that Trump is really talking about, which is how do politics get funded? What's the role of the media and all of that, which is, you know, they make all their money. So why wouldn't they just put Trump on over and over and over again, right? They know the ratings go through the roof. If you're not, until you address that, right, then you're not going to have a different kind of election. This is not some, in my view, not some aberration. This is actually what we've created. It just happens to be this time that it's very exaggerated in terms of, you know, what's happening. Well, it's, um, it's fast. I mean, uh, this is really, uh, you know, I, this is why I like having a free form conversation. Yeah. We're all over uh, the place. But, uh, I, you know, did you have I just wanted you to talk about a couple of things. You're, yeah. in, you're in Colorado. Uh, did, did, did was I wrong or was there an, an initiative on the on the ballot about single payer? There is. There is. Is. Okay, I and want I want to I want to ask you just a philosophical question because ultimately that's what my show is about is philosophy, right. wisdom, and love. And I, right. you know, to me it's like, do you it, do you think it will pass? And then the other part of it is, how proud are you if it does pass, or even if it just narrowly misses? But how proud are you of the fact that you would live in a state that? basically is saying you know you can be that rugged truck driver or you can be that single mom or you can be uh, a fortune 500 broker but everyone's going to have access to health care and nobody's going to be dying on the street and do you feel proud of the fact and do you think it lessens tensions among i think that there's just this huge amount of resentment going on in this country as as we've talked about sure. but but how do you feel if it does pass how do you think fundamentally it has will change the vibe in Colorado well you know it's funny jake is that i don't think you get any group of people regardless of their um you know political persuasion or regardless of their worldview you get them all into a room right and just ask that question and say 
do you think people should have access to decent health care? And, and how many of us have been jerked around by insurance companies, right? I mean, mm-hmm. really, seriously, sure. right? Has anybody not had that experience, right? <laughs> Where basically what's being covered is going down and it's getting much more expensive, right? And I don't think you'd see much disagreement in theory, right, about right. that. Right. Now, there are going to be all kinds of different ways to get there. So certainly single payer it is an interesting idea because it, 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 it seems like it addresses the situation in a very rational way. Um, whereas what we're seeing with Obamacare, which I'm always a believer in, take a step, right? Don't, don't take a step and then amend and so on. But it seems from the outside, and, and certainly the news this last couple of weeks, is that the insurance companies and the, and the uh, you know, uh, pharmaceutical companies are too involved in this. And, and to a certain extent, why are premiums going up for everybody that now has been told that they have to have? So we have friends that you know, are not well off, that are really, you know, a 25% jump in their uh, health care is huge, and it's hugely bureaucratic. I don't know how it is where you guys are, but in, in Colorado, the exchange here is really hard, you know, to deal with. It's it's a lot of well-meaning people, but just a bad system, right? I wanted to stop you for a second, because you said something, You this goes back to the, the, the you talk about the presidency changing, mm. and the idea here of uh, the whole process, the, the whole, of how laws are created, the, the, with the civil, I don't need to tell you this, but with civil rights, the the first ones were passed in the early 60s, and there were sure. nine amendments after that. So there was amendments, right? But now, sure. with the stagnation and loggerheads of Congress, I mean, the, the, you can pass a law, but if 20-something states are already going to sabotage it and no one's going to amend anything, it's going to die in the water. Exactly. Okay, so go ahead. Continue. Well, so then I will say what's happening here in Colorado, because I have friends that are involved in that initiative, and yeah. they don't have any hope that it's going to pass. Now, I, I keep saying to them, just keep at it, right? Because it, sometimes it takes two or three, four or five cycles, you know, to, to keep at it. Well, why isn't it going to pass? Well, the money that is being spent on the other side of that, and you can imagine who's spending it, mm-hmm. um, uh, they're terrified of a single-payer system. And I'm not saying single-payer is some, you know, magic bullet that Panacea, solves everything. Right, right, right. But, it, but it's certainly better than, than anybody that's dealt with insurance companies or pharmaceutical companies, particularly if you have chronic illness or crisis or whatever. I mean, it's just a nightmare, right? So, And doctors, you know, good, well-meaning doctors that simply won't take insurance anymore. I mean, I'm old enough now to have Medicare, and, uh, you know, I fortunately I'm in Boulder, so there are a lot of practitioners here who take it. But to a certain extent, how much it pays them for what they do for me, I'm embarrassed about, actually. I, I just go, I, I just don't understand why the payment wouldn't be more than that. You know, it because you're performing, you know, whatever service. So, sure. So these are all things that, that um, you know, is the big mystery about how change takes place, because we can rant and rave like we've been doing about how it could be better or how it could be this and that. And then, you know, you got to pick your poison and go figure out what you want to spend your time on and then figure out where the traction points are and then be ready as the world worlds in ways that we just can't imagine when we start those things. And hopefully the system will be better at some point or there'll be a different thing. I mean, one of the most... Um, one one of the most staggering things that I'm seeing right now in terms of a narrative in the whole artificial intelligence conversation is that anybody that's paying attention sees the displacement of jobs that's going on. And this isn't just blue collar jobs. This is now up into uh, white middle class, any analyst, people that are particularly in the financial business, anybody that's been sitting in a cubicle doing analysis on news so that they can make you know uh, predictions on stocks or whatever. All of that is being taken over by algorithms, and it does a better job. It doesn't have to sleep. You don't have to. Pay, you don't have to sure. pay it healthcare. Sure. It just and it actually has better results. It it creates better results, and so it's better information. So those folks are going to be out of a job, you know, in five years, right? And so in that conversation, it's really interesting. Underlying that conversation is actually something that is so un-American. I mean, when we think, when, you know, uh, any conversation or narrative that you have about freedom and independence and we're not socialists and we're not communists or whatever, right? The suggestion is is that there is going to deal with this disruption, is that you're going to have to provide a minimum, or not a minimum wage, but a minimum uh, amount of support for people, which will include health care. Because they are, there is going to be such a displacement that if they don't, if that isn't done, you're going to have a lot of angry people on the street lighting torches and heading toward the one percent, right? So 
I'm just amazed. I mean, that raise 10 years ago, people would have, you know, just gone, what are you talking about, becoming communist or something where everybody gets a dole or whatever, you know? And you kind of go, well, this is, this is being talked about. And I, I'm just amazed that it actually is a conversation that's going on fairly seriously among people that know. So. Well, I mean, we have just been burning. We have to do another part two here, man. <laughs> I mean, I, well, thanks, Jake. No, in, 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 in two minutes, just tell me why you love Diane. Uh, she wasn't able to come on the show today. Oh, she wasn't. No. Well, Diane is is one of the uh, one of the teachers and personalities within the Integral community that we report on at Integral Life. Um, and I just love Diane because, as she likes to say, uh, she comes from rodeo queen roots right. and became a very, very talented and powerful Buddhist teacher um, and also does a lot of work with her, with her husband, Michael, um, on mediation skills and, you know, mediating uh, crisis and so on. Um, and she's just one of our stars. I mean, um, she's great at our conferences. Uh, she's got a you know a great sense of humor, but a deep, you know, abiding wisdom about um, Buddhist spiritual teachings that 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 is part of her lineage, which is she's passing on now. Well, uh, I, listen, I really had a ball with you. Let's uh, let's connect and do do one around the uh, part two around the holiday season. We'll see where things are at at that. Well, point. you know, this will be fun, Jake, as you said it. Let, let's talk after the election. Exactly. exactly. Because I, I don't you know, whether Hillary wins or I hope or whether Trump wins and you just go, you know, oh my God, yeah, I right. Hope you're right. I hope you're right that this was all a fake. Right. And whatever. Right. But if it's not, there's still even if Hillary wins. Right. That you can already see the forces you know, aligning it. We're not out of this. No, it, and it's, some of it and a lot more. And like you said, most of it's gravitational. I mean, it it's, is. it's really heavy, it man. So great hang. And yeah. uh, we'll talk soon. Thank you, Jake. Later, Appreciate David. It, man. All right, buddy. Good work. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you, brother. Another heavy day on the Jake Feinberg show. Thanks to Mike Roper. We'll be back next week. More heaviness. Peace. Thank you.